big silence. Hello and welcome to the Big Silence podcast. Oh, thanks for having me. <laughs> My co-host is back, Bobby Goldstein. Hello. I'm excited because you know what we're doing this week? We're going to do another episode with the two of us. Oh, yes. That's your favorite, I know. But uh, so today's episode comes out during National Suicide Prevention Week. Mm -hmm. It is with Kayla Steckline. Um, it is a pretty heavy conversation. Um, so, yeah, and we promote, uh, you know, this week, if we have our crisis text line here at The Big Silence, it's you text HERO, H-E-R-O, to 741741. We talk about it more in the podcast. And Bobby, mm -hmm. in your experience, you lost a best friend to suicide or mm -hmm. by suicide. Can you explain that a little bit? Your friend, Chris? I know you weren't expecting me to ask know, you this right now. You've, you've got a towel around your neck ready to go jump in the cold I plunge. know. I was bring, bringing the light vibes. Okay. Um, I'd say it was uh, it was a shock, for sure. Um, without going into details of it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, just a, you know, a great friend in our group of guy friends. And, you know... Maybe like looking back, maybe there's little snippets of um, struggle, but nothing that, you know, you would, you would think, okay, we have to step in here. Um, so you really just never know kind of when to have some, some deeper conversations with friends, check in a little more. Um, and then now being a bit older and kind of, we knew family history. Um, and things going on at home, but like, you know, you kind of brush that stuff off, but like you're one that knows that, you know, deep family trauma that carries mm -hmm. on. Um, yeah. And, you know, unfortunately, later after Chris, um, their father, um, you know, also succumbed to the same scenario. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. As you look back, is there something, well, first of all, warning signs that you noticed that you didn't notice? Mm -hmm. And then also, I mean, I can't imagine, I feel like this intro could be a whole episode mm -hmm. um, because of Chris taking his life and then the father, someone who I imagine like the family around and the friends around, how they cope. Um, well. At the time, he was living with his girlfriend in New York, and her life changed instantly. Um, she found him, and, you know, she had to move and start her entire life over again. Um, you know, I think, I think everybody just kind of has a, a point. I mean, life carries on outside of it, too. So, like, for people that are feeling the struggle, like the world, everything's going to continue, you know, and your life would too. And so it's like, I don't know, you always see the people where they're like in a moment where you're making that question just like one more day, right? Mm -hmm. And keep asking that question and you keep, keep going. Um, I think everybody just kind of still has the pain of it, but, you know, it's a big part of our, our group of friends and it's a, it's just, I don't know. It's still sad to think about, but it's always there. Yeah. So I would take my takeaway from that would be one more day. Like if you're thinking about this, like one more day, just hang in there because reach out to friends, reach out to family, reach out to, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the crisis text line and just think in your head one more day because the next day will be better. Yeah. I think we've all been in positions where we feel like we've totally fucked up for loss of a better word. And there's, oh, this is it. This sucks. There's no way out of it. And there always is. Like, it's mm -hmm. just, it, it seems like that. But there always is, you know, a continuation. There always is another chance. There's always another day. Um, but when you're feeling it, you know, a lot goes into that. I know. I always think of this too shall pass. 
Mm. After the darkness comes the light. Um, so our guest today, or our guest, my guest. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm I'm no longer intro. Did, did I get co-host status? Wow. <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> So Kayla Steckline, I started, I came across her story about four years ago. So her husband, Andrew, was the pastor of their church. And it's a really good conversation about suicide, mental health. And Kayla has a new book coming out called Rebuilding Beautiful. And she thought she had this perfect life and everything got turned upside down. And now she's rebuilding this life with her three sons, all under the age of 10. So here it is, and um, again, we've got the crisis text line. If anyone feels triggered during this conversation, please reach out, and um, here you go. All right. Welcome to the podcast, Kayla Steckline. Thanks so much for having me. Honored to be here. Yeah, I was just having a few words with Kayla right before this, and I had come across your story now. It must have been almost four years ago about Andrew, your husband, um, who died by suicide. And I don't know, something in me, as I was telling you, I had my own, you know, as a child, my own attempt, and I'm so grateful to just be alive and be here. And I think your story is so powerful because it can save so many lives. And it can help. Also, I get a lot of questions from um, listeners and just how to also deal with grief. So we're going to dive into everything, but I would love if you would be open to share your story and your life with Andrew. Yeah. So Andrew and I met super young. Um, I think I was 19 and he was 20 years old and we were in college and he was one of the beach house guys, this crew of boys that lived in this nasty, dirty beach house in Newport Beach, California. And I couldn't wait to meet him. One of my friends was dating one of his friends. He had picked me out from a picture and I was so nervous and went over there and I met him and It was just a fast fall into love. Like I had never had a serious relationship before and I just fell hard for Andrew. And we were engaged a year later and married a year after that. So I was 21, he was 22. We had no idea what we had signed up for. We had no idea what we were doing, but we were learning along the way. And um, he was called to ministry. He wanted to be a pastor. And so we just jumped right into the world of ministry, um, which is a full on world. Andrew always said the Sundays just keep on coming and they do, you know, it's not some people that attend church might not know. There's a lot that happens behind the scenes um, in between those Sundays. And so it's full time invested, started having kids. Uh, We were walking with his dad. His dad was the lead pastor of the church. We were walking with him through his leukemia journey. It was a four year battle with leukemia. And my husband just um, took on more responsibility over that four-year time and eventually became the lead pastor of our church, of a big church in Chino, California, uh, like 4,000 people, big staff, 35 people. He was like 26 years old. So huge responsibility. His dad passed away just a few months later. We're still like, I'm pregnant. We're still popping out babies and life is full His job is stressful. There's a lot of pressure. He has a lot to prove. He's super young. And, you know, I think all of that, the grief of losing his father, like all of that eventually just caught up with him and he totally burned out. So in the fall of 2017, um, he started having panic attacks. And if you've ever had a panic attack or witnessed a panic attack, then you know just how terrifying it can be. I mean, they would come on at night like three to four times a week and there was nothing I could do to help him. And there was nothing he could do to help himself. I mean, he'd be pacing around the house. He'd be curled up in a ball on the floor. He'd be crying. He'd be mad. He'd be shaking. I mean, it was just this full body experience. The fear had just taken over his body and we just had to wait it out. And so 
we were doing everything we knew to do to get him help. We were seeing a doctor. We thought at first the panic attacks were maybe just some kind of medical issue. Like maybe he's got a thyroid issue. Maybe he's like needs to eat better. Maybe, you know, like maybe he needs to take more vitamins. Like we really thought it was going to be an easy fix. Um, but the panic attacks just kept getting worse. Even though we were trying what the doctor was recommending, they just kept getting worse. And it got so bad where he ended up in the hospital. And the doctors still, they checked everything and they couldn't find any other thing wrong with him. And so we put him on a sabbatical. He took some time off work and we decided we needed to go see a psychiatrist. So we went and saw a psychiatrist and he was diagnosed with depression. And I was shocked. You know, I think I was just super naive and um, busy with, you know, chasing after a three young boys who were two, four, and five years old. And I just didn't fully see, you know, all the warning signs and all the red flags and all the ways that he um, was depressed and all the ways that life had just caught up with him and he was totally burnt out. Um, and so we started this journey with depression and. Um, you, you say it, we tried it. We literally tried everything we knew to do to get him better. He was seeing a psychiatrist. He was taking medication. We were seeing a therapist together for two hours every single week. He was spending time with mentors. He wasn't working. He was resting. Like we really were trying everything we knew to do to get him better. And by August of 2018, we actually thought he was getting better. And the doctors thought that the next right step for him and his healing journey would be to go back to work. And so he went back to work and he was pumped. He was excited. He was excited to talk about mental health. He was excited to talk about depression and suicide. He gave out the suicide hotline number. He gave out statistics from the NAMI website. Like he knew all the facts. He would have known where to go for help and then preached two weekends. And then he was headed towards the third weekend, had his message written, was excited for Sunday and just had an awful, awful day at the office. His mind wasn't fully healed. Um, he had told our staff and told our family that he was at about 65% when he went back to work. So I think it was probably less than that. You know, looking back, I, I don't think he was fully well. And I think he had pushed himself to go back to work before he was fully ready. And so we all knew like, okay, this is, it was, it was enough for us to like take a few steps back, our family and our, our, the leadership of our church and kind of say like, okay, maybe this guy still needs more help. Maybe he wasn't ready to go back to work. Maybe we need to try some other avenues of healing. Maybe he needs to go to an inpatient facility. Like it was bad enough where we knew okay, this guy needs more help. And so the following day, while we were trying to just check all our boxes and line up, make, make a plan and find a speaker for Sunday and get him checked into a facility and just check all of our boxes, he attempted suicide. And it was the worst day of my life. I mean, still the absolute worst day of my life. And it was incredibly shocking. Um, we knew it was bad, but we didn't know it was that bad. Um, we didn't know that suicide was so close. Um, and so I don't even think Andrew knew. You look, looking back, it's like, I think Andrew was just as shocked as the rest of us by the suicide. And he was rushed to the hospital. They had gotten his heart to beat again and he was rushed to the hospital. And we were given the gift of one last day just to say goodbye and lay with him and hold him and pray over him. And on August 25th, 2018, he took his last breath and I took my first in this life that I never saw coming as a widow at 29 years old uh, with three little boys that were two, four, and five. So it's been a journey the last four years of trying to navigate life without my husband and trying to figure out where do we go from here. Oh, just listening to your story makes me emotional. And I cry a lot on this podcast, <laughs> but I'm um, just... Wow. Okay. So I want to go back and talk about any signs that you may have seen. The panic attacks, number one, did you know what a panic attack was back then? And did you take it seriously? Because I started having major, I understand panic attacks if you've had them. And I'm, have you had them since? No. I haven't. Wow. No. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, can we talk about signs that you may yeah. have missed? 
Totally. You know, what's wild is that I have a bachelor's degree in psychology and I think I just must, you know, the information must have gone in one ear and out the other because I didn't fully understand what was happening. Um, And I think I was just consumed by motherhood and trying to keep up with the daily demands of motherhood and ministry that I just didn't see him. I couldn't see him. I was so close to him that I couldn't see him. And um, yes, the panic attacks, you know, were the first, you know, it's like, it's like the dashboard of your mind and your mental health. And it's like lights, you know, just like we have a dashboard in our car, like the lights start flickering, the lights start going off. It's like, oh, it's time to get an oil change. It's time to start, stop for gas. Oh, there's like a big exclamation point. It's really time to pull over, you know, to figure out what's happening. And so there were warning signs. There were things that were happening that um, looking back, you know, that I totally missed. And I think it really, you know, his mental health really was impacted even going back way further than that, when his dad was diagnosed with leukemia and, you know, he was watching his best friend, his mentor, his hero, the person he looked up to the most dying. And he was having to step into these huge shoes to this massive role at a really young age while the person that he loved the most is passing away. So, you know, there were days during that four-year period where he didn't want to get out of bed. Uh, where he was probably drinking more than he should have been, um, where he was just checked out, not himself, not fully present in the ways that he normally was. And so I think it started, you know, then, um, and it just continued to get worse um, until the panic attacks started. And there were other things happening. You know, I think he felt a big pressure to not only fill the shoes of his dad, at our church, but to also fill the shoes of his dad and our family. And so he felt protective over his mom. He felt protective over his siblings. And we had a stalker issue. We had like a really like big stalker issue um, that we were facing as a family. And that it was the the panic attack started after that. So So like a stalker. Like the final straw that, yeah, that was like the final straw that broke the camel's back. That really was like, oh my gosh, it was just too much. It was too much. And so, um, yeah, I started having these panic attacks and I really never even thought that it was going to be a mental health thing. I didn't even put the two and two together. I didn't think depression. I didn't think, you know, Andrew was an intense person. He had a bent toward it, towards anxiety. He was a perfectionist. He would stand in the mirror and pick every little piece of dead skin off his face before he left the house, a little bit OCD. So he had a tent, like, you know, just a, a bent towards those things already. And so, it was like those those things slowly um, magnified. And because he already had a bent towards them, it's like I couldn't really see it. Or I didn't fully understand. I just thought like, this is just getting more intense. You know, this is just like, you know, it's just like his personality is getting more intense. Um, I didn't know that he was struggling with mental illness and he didn't even know he was struggling with mental illness. Did mental illness run in the family? Have Do you know any... Yes, uh, yeah. there were some family members that had struggled with depression and suicidal ideation. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And we knew that. Yeah. But neither one of us had ever struggled. You know, neither one of us had ever struggled with depression or ever had a close friend or close family member that struggled with depression. And so um, I think we just didn't, we just didn't know, you know, we just had no idea what we were up against and we had no idea... I think depression manifests itself in ways that we don't always recognize. Um, Andrew's depression especially manifested himself in more in anger. You know, it was like he was angry and he was frustrated and stressed. And it's like those things would cause some of the panic attacks. And those things are the things that would be like shocking and surprising and jolting. And when you think depression, you don't always think that. You think sad. You know, and he didn't seem sad. (laughs) <laughs> well, yeah. So, but so it was anger. So prior mm-hmm. to um, taking um, dying by suicide, was he? Yeah. Did he have that? Like, was there something that night? Like, was he angry? Was he just? Mm-hmm. Is there something there that you witnessed that you knew it was? Yeah, coming. Yeah, and there were there were moments, you know, throughout our journey that 
you know, there were moments when he was exhausted and he was tired. It was unpredictable. It's like every single day, I didn't know what version of my husband was going to come walking out of our bedroom at home, or if he was even going to come walking out of the bedroom. Like every single day, it was different. Some days he'd walk out happy. Some days he'd walk out crying. Some days he'd walk out angry or something small would make him angry. It's like he was just on the edge. And he was, he was always a little bit on the edge. It's just his personality, you know, he had a yeah. bent towards that. And so I think it was hard for me to see um, that he was really struggling. And it was hard for me to have compassion and empathy and really even see him and understand what he was dealing with. And, you know, there was a moment um, where he did talk about suicide and it was after the kids had gone to bed. And I, we were sitting at the kitchen counter in our home and I was venting to him about my own exhaustion and frustration and how, how run down and tired and isolated and lonely that I felt even in my own home. And his uh, response to me was he was venting back to me and he was telling me about his struggles, what he was dealing with. And he told me he was up the night before in the middle of the night and he had his staff organization charts spread all over the kitchen counter and he thought about killing himself. And I was so depleted, so exhausted that I just reacted out of my own exhaustion and out of my own emotion. And I shot back to him and I told him that's the most selfish thing you could ever do. You would never do that to me and the boys. How dare you even say that to me? Like I was mad. It felt like here I am saying I'm exhausted and I'm worn out and I feel lonely and you're saying you're going to leave me. That's what it felt like in the moment. And I wasn't able to see, you know, that that's not the way you're supposed to respond. And he even said that to me. He said, Kayla, you need to do some research and come up with something better to say, because that's not the way that you respond when someone tells you that they're struggling with that. And I just didn't know. I really, truly believed that it would never happen. I thought he was just being dramatic. I thought he was, you know, clawing for attention. I really, truly never believed that it would happen because he had a great life. He had these three beautiful, incredible boys. He was um, living, you know, in in a beautiful home. He had an encouraging wife that would do anything for him. He had family that would do anything for him. He was doing his dream job. Like on paper, he had everything he could have ever wanted. So I really, truly believed that it would never happen. I just had no idea how fragile his mind really was. And he was trying to tell me and I just couldn't see him and couldn't hear him um, because I, I was too close to it and just and just didn't understand. But you as well are handling a lot. You were saying, you know, you never knew how he was going to show up through the door that day. You have the three kids. So, I mean, I just want to give you credit too as being the mother and in the household, like taking care of everything yes. and you're allowed to vent as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I know with someone who is struggling with mental health and learning that empathy, that's what I had to learn a lot about. And um, you mentioned NAMI earlier. Um, so, I'm on the board of advisors for NAMI, and my husband and I went to the family to family program. That was a third, it's a free 13 week course. And it's just so my husband, because I normalize chaos, <laughs> and it was a course in one week. It was just about having empathy for someone who's struggling because it's really hard yeah. on both members, yeah. family members, loved ones. Um, what have you learned about empathy? You know, I think so often we think we need to show up uh, when somebody's hurting, when someone's grieving, when somebody's sick, when somebody's struggling. I think so often we think we need to show up with all the right things to say. Mm-hmm. And I think empathy is more about presence than words. I think empathy is more about pulling up a chair or crawling into that dark space and just sitting and holding and being with and looking eyeball to eyeball um, into the eyes of the person that we love and just being fully being with them without an agenda and um, trying as best as we can to see life from their perspective, to see life from their shoes, to um, step out of our own ego that's calling for attention out of our own, you know, worldview and just sit long enough with them in that space to see what life is like from their point of view. And yeah, I think, you know, when when you're walking alongside somebody that's struggling with their 
mental health, especially when it's a spouse or when it's a child, it's someone that you're doing life with every single day. The mistake that I made is that you have to take time to care for yourself. You have to take time to fill back up your cup so that you have um, that to give, so that you have love to give, so that you have empathy and compassion to give. I had nothing left to give. You know, and Andrew um, totally didn't benefit from that. You know, I wish I would have taken time to see a therapist one on one. I wish I would have taken time to get away by myself, like he was taking time to get away by himself. I wish I would have had a babysitter scheduled for a whole day once a week just to like go sit and read, go drive down to the beach, go do something for me, go get my nails done or my hair done or go see a movie and just take some time to take a deep breath and fill myself back up. And, you know, now I know um, so much better when someone tells you that they're struggling with their mental health, when someone tells you that they're struggling with suicidal thoughts, it's time to lean in. Mm -hmm. It's time to ask questions. Questions are powerful. Questions can change the game. Questions like, do you have a suicide plan? What problem are you trying to solve through suicide? Do you know when or how you would do it? Have you researched it? How far have you thought about it? How far have you dove into it? How often are you thinking about it? Um, I wish I would have taken it seriously. I wish I would have picked up the phone and called the suicide hotline number or texted the crisis text line. I wish I would have told his therapist, his psychiatrist, our close family members that were walking alongside us through this journey, the mentors that were walking alongside him through his journey, the board of directors at our church. I wish I would have filled in the team. You know, I think looking back, what I can see now is that um, mental illness has to be treated as a team. It's not a one-to-one thing. It's like, it's gotta be team. And you got to have a lot of people checking in with this person when it's serious and when it's life or death and when they're struggling with suicidal thoughts. It can't just be, it couldn't just be me. It needed to be other voices that were also checking in with him. And I wish I would have asked about suicide every single day. I wish I would have asked him if he was struggling with suicidal thoughts every single day. I think the word suicide made me so uncomfortable, like it does many of us. And now mm-hmm. I talk about it all the time that I'm so used to saying yeah. it. I wrote a whole book about it. You know, it's like never thought um, that I'd be talking about suicide as much as I am. But I think that word alone makes us feel totally uncomfortable. And so getting past that discomfort and learning to say that word out loud and getting comfortable um, with that word and really taking it seriously are some of the best things we can do. And some of the best ways we can have empathy um, is, is to like try our best to see them and try our best to take care of ourselves so that we have energy and a full tank to truly be able to see them. Yeah, I know. And that's the stigma too, the word suicide, where someone mm-hmm. might say it and then someone may just be like, brush it off because it's such an uncomfortable yeah. conversation. And that's why it's so important to be able to talk about it openly and normalize it because that is what a lot of people are feeling. What is it? Like almost a million people per mm-hmm. year die by suicide. Like yeah. this conversation is just like, how are you? And I love that you say like, just listening more and having empathy. You don't have to have the answers or the cure, but what you said, have bring a team in. Mm-hmm. And as a human race, like we just need to be there for each other and with non-judgment. And yeah, I want to go and I have a question. So um, Andrew was the pastor and at Christian church. Yeah. Was there a stigma around his mental health in the church? You know, I think, I think, yes. I think I even had my own stigma around it um, as well. And, you know, I think so often, I think it's changing. I think there's more, there's been um, other pastors that have died by suicide after Andrew died. And it's kind of shaken up the conversation and started um, more conversations where pastors are getting brave enough to talk about it from the stage and talk about mental health and depression and suicide. But I think so often um, those of us, you know, that believe in God or um, have strong faith, we can think that mental illness is something that can be prayed away. And with enough time in prayer, with enough time sitting with God, if you read your Bible enough, if you're in a small group, if you're going to church on Sunday, you should never struggle with your mental with your mental health. Um, and that's just not true. That's just like simply not true. 
it's like our mental illness is just as real as any other physical illness. It's just as deadly as any other physical illness. And yes, we are spiritual beings, but we're also physical beings. We have physical bodies that get sick. And so I think being able to see that and understand that like, yes, pray, yes, go to church. Yes, be plugged into community. Like yes to all those things, but also yes to therapy. Yes to seeing a psychiatrist. Yes to like taking care of your body and seeing a holistic doctor or doing exercise or doing with all the other things you need to do to take care of your physical body. Yes to medication. Yes to all those things, you know? So I think it's helped me expanded my um, view on all of that. But I think, you know, the Big C Church for sure probably has a long way to go to bridge the gap between mental health and ministry and expand their view as well. You know, I think one of the biggest myths um, also that I believed that um, suicide was like a straight ticket to hell, that if you died by suicide, you couldn't get into heaven. And I remember um, as Andrew was dying in the hospital, I leaned over the hospital bed and I asked my mother-in-law, will he go to heaven? And she reassured me then, you know, as I'm reassured now is that his salvation didn't hinge on the way that he died. His salvation hinged on his relationship with Jesus. And that's what we believe. And that's what he believed. And so, you know, I can, I, I can hold on. That's hope for me and my boys that I can hold on to that. Yes, we will see him again. And yes, he's healed and whole on the other side of heaven. And yes, we didn't get the miracle that we wanted here. Um, but we have that hope to hold on to. Yeah. I just asked that question too. Like, so my mother with her mental illness and I have all of her journals after she passed and a lot, she was suicidal for the last 10 years of her life. But you know, she, because of her faith, she's like, I can't do this. So I know that's like a big struggle, but then I don't have the answers and neither do you, but, you know, just no. sharing this, that there is that big struggle where you say mental yeah. health and ministry. And um, yeah, it's, I want to shift to you, or unless you want to have anything to say about that comment anymore. I just saw you shaking. Yeah. Your yeah. yeah, I just, I'm just thinking of the person that's listening to this that's been hurt by the church, that someone from the church has disregarded their mental health or disregarded their mental illness or said, said something hurtful to them. And um, yeah, just thinking of that person and, and just want to say that you're seen and you're heard and um, your mental health matters and it's not a sin issue and it's not a spiritual issue. And um, you don't have to prove anything to anybody that you're more than enough, that you're loved, that you're seen, that you're valued, um, just as you are. I just felt that um, in that moment when we were talking about that. Just I know there's people listening to this, that um, there's been Christians or people that love Jesus that have said the wrong things to them. So just wanted to say that. Thank you for saying that. I think that's really important. Um, are you? going to church? Do you go to the same church still or where are you at now? Yeah. So we, um, I, I stayed at the church for about a year, a little less than a year. Um, we were planning a women's event, you know, before he died. So I wanted to see that through, you know, my mother-in-law were planning that and me and my mother-in-law actually preached his last message together, which was really special. Um, and I wanted to stick around, you know, for the people I wanted to show people that you don't have to leave when something hard like this happens, you know, that the church wasn't built on Andrew. The church wasn't built on the step lines. Like the church is ultimately built on God and it should um, keep going with or without that person. And so I wanted to stay and kind of model that. And so I did as long as I could. Um, and then I couldn't anymore. And I knew that it was time for us to go. And so we church hopped for a long time and we recently moved just a few years ago. We moved about an hour away from the church um, towards the ocean. So now we're living with the ocean in our backyard. And it's been such a gift. Um, so many gifts hidden within just that decision to move and to take back the power of our story and to give my boys back the power of their story. And so their story isn't told for them and doesn't follow them around as they grow up. Um, you know, it's like, it's been such a gift to have a fresh start. And we've recently found a church in town that we've plugged into. And one of my friends um, that actually met on the biggest ball field, she had lost her husband to suicide too. And she had read my book and we connected and she started a widow's ministry in town at this church. And so once a month we get together, is like 40 widows that come um, from all over the area. And 
we get together and have community and just spend time together and it helps all of us not to feel alone. Um, so slowly trying to figure out what that looks like for us here, but knowing that um, I value that for me and my boys and I still believe that church is important and um, I don't I don't want all the pressure to be on me to uh, speak into that part of my boy's life. And I had such a great experience with church growing up. I loved, you know, all the, the camps and the youth group and all things. So um, yeah, I'm grateful for the way that God's led us in that and um, grateful for the place that we found. Yeah. So focusing more on you and the trauma you've experienced and the healing for all of those widows out there who are looking for hope. And mm-hmm. you have your new book coming out this month. Uh, and, and this podcast is going out during um, National Suicide Prevention Week. And you have your new book, Rebuilding Beautiful. And I just want to, like, how are you? Because there's focus. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of myself included. We ask about Andrew, his story. Yeah. And you're obviously strength standing by him. But I can't imagine how you are healing through trauma. And I know that trauma lives on for the our entire yeah. lives. Yep. Yeah, it's been a journey. Um, like you said, it's been about four years since he passed away. And I would say for the first three years, I was in deep in the pain. And I didn't struggle with panic attacks, but I did struggle with suicidal thoughts. I really, they reached points in my healing journey where the thought of having to wake up again the next day and live with the pain that I had been handed felt overwhelming and I didn't know if I could do it. And um, so it's been a journey, you know, and and I am in this new book that's coming out. I broke down the process, the process for me in rebuilding my life. And as I say, rebuilding beautiful, um, which that phrase was born in a conversation that I had with one of my friends. And I was sitting on my, for- my front porch swing at the house we used to live at. And I was explaining to her how I had this beautiful life. I truly had it everything I could have ever asked for and more. And it's like that whole life died with with Andrew and I was handed a brand new life that I never saw coming. And I so deeply wanted to believe that that brand new life, even though it was going to look so different than it did before, could still be beautiful. And I said these words to her, I said, it's as if I'm rebuilding beautiful. And those words have just stuck around. I started using them on Instagram. Other people adopted them. And I started to see that there was something here. There was something, some kind of message here, that there was a message of hope hidden within those words. And it wasn't just for me, um, that it was a message of hope that other people could hold on to, no matter what they're going through, You know, whether it's a divorce or whether it's... Um, a death of a loved one or whether it's a big move or a career shift, you know, I think it can, it's a broad stroke and can fit so many different transition seasons of life. Um, But I broke down my process that I've been going through in the last four years into five parts. And those five parts are embrace, heal, explore, dream, and live. And those are the things that I think we need to do in order to move forward. And those are the things that I've done the last four years in order to move forward. And embrace is is, is embracing our pain. It's stepping towards the pain. I'm sure as you know, it's like you can't get over it or under it or around it. Like the only way through is through. And you have to plunge into the darkness to finally reach the light. You have to go through the pain. I remember sitting in my therapist's office and explaining to her that I was struggling with suicidal thoughts and that I was overwhelmed and felt depressed and felt just like, oh, like overwhelmed by the weight of my pain. And I remember her saying to me, Kayla, the way you're feeling is exactly how you're supposed to feel. Mm-hmm. And I think so often we want to avoid pain and we don't want to step towards the pain and we don't want to welcome our pain and embrace our pain. But if we don't do that, we are missing out on one of the greatest teachers of our lives. Like my pain has taught me so much. My pain has expanded my worldview. My pain has given me eyes to see other people that are also struggling with pain because pain is pain is pain. You know, my pain is going to look different than other, another person's pain. Um, but it's totally just given me this access to this deeper stream of community that I never had access to before. And then heal obviously is like taking those hard steps of healing. It's going to therapy. It's processing our trauma. If we don't process our trauma, if we don't process 
process our pain, it's going to be handed down to the to generations to come. You know, the best gift I can give my kids is a healthy me. The best gift I can give my kids is a healed version of me. Um, going to therapy has been such a gift. I went to therapy for an hour every single week for the first three years of my loss. And now I do maintenance therapy where I'm going, you know, once every couple months or once every other month. And it's been such a gift just to sit in that neutral space um, with someone that I don't see every single day and to process whatever I need to process and to be totally vulnerable and totally real. I think therapy only works if you're honest and to show up in that space and be totally blunt and honest with what I'm going through has been such an incredible um, gift. And then also like seeking community, finding those communities, you know, finding um, those people that I sit with once a month at the widow's group, you know, saying yes to the invitations to go sit with other people. I've gone on a few retreats, you know, widow retreats as well. There's a group called Never Alone Widows. If you're listening to this and you're a widow, check out Never Alone Widows because they're doing incredible ministry for widows. And it's just such a gift to be able to go to one of their retreats or conferences. Um, but, you know, being with other people and being with my community and being with my group of friends, like I've been able to share my pain. I'm not holding on to my pain all alone. I'm able to share my pain. And because of the group of people I have surrounding me, the intimate friendships that I have, the pain has been shared and lifted. And then, you know, just stepping towards explore and dream and exploring this new world saying, okay, yes, my husband died, but I'm still alive. Like, Mm -hmm. yes, that life is over, but, but also at the end of that, the end of that old life was a new beginning. And it's this new life. And so what does life look like now? It's only 29 years old. I'm 33 now. Like I'm still relatively young. Like what does life look like now? And so getting curious and asking questions and asking myself, you know, rediscovering my identity because my identity was so wrapped up in who Andrew was. He was my identity. He was my world. Like Mm -hmm. he was everything. And so he died and it's like, who am I now? that he's gone. And so asking myself some of those harder questions, like, who am I now? What do I like? What don't I like? What lights my soul on fire? What am I passionate about? What am I excited about? What do I love to do? How do I want to raise my kids? What experiences do I want to give to them? Getting curious, you know, about about this new world and this new life that I was handed in this new world that I stepped into. And then daring to dream again, daring to like look to the, towards the future and say, what is the vision for the next five, 10, 15 years for my life? Like, where do I want to be? Who do I want by my side? What do I want my life to look like? And then taking action. You know, I had the dream of living by the ocean and I was terrified to leave. You know, we had, I had my family right down the street. The boys were at a private Christian school where a lot of the teachers went to our church. They were known, they had good friends. We had a great house that was paid off. And so I was terrified to leave. And, um, but I did, you know, I pushed through that fear and I did because I had the dream of raising my kids by the sea. I had the dream of living somewhere else and having a fresh start and it's been worth it. I mean, it's been so worth it every single day. It's been so worth it to push through that fear to get here. And so it's so many things, you know, and ultimately it's, it's choosing to live. It's choosing to be fully alive and fully present and fully invested. It's choosing to accept the invitation to new life and to to let go of my clinging to the life that was and to ultimately welcome what is and, and begin to dream about what could be. And so, you know, it's so many things. It was so much fun to write this new book um, because it is so many things and they're all little standalone chapters and there's just all these little lessons that I've learned um, through these last four years. And my hope is that it would just um, give hope to people that are also on the journey of rebuilding their life. And that would give them hope that life can still be beautiful, even though that old version of beautiful uh, may have passed away. Life can still be beautiful and you're here God has a plan for your life and you get to dream again and you get to fully live and you get to find joy and choose joy and um, be fully alive here and now. So, yeah, yeah. I'm definitely going to read that book. And it's also not (laughs) just, I mean, if you're listening, it's not just for the widows or someone who's gone through so much pain, but even um, like, you know, I was my mother's caretaker and just... And you were, your identity was around Andrew. 
And Mm -hmm. then once those people are gone, like for me, it's like there's this space in my brain that I, I don't know, like what to do with it. It's just like, it's taking that and turning it into something magical and not being the victim, but really you're an incredible role model and your sons are very blessed to have a mother so strong as you are, even though being having strength like that doesn't mean, like you said, having suicidal thoughts, but Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just being human and what you've been going through. But you, I want to go back to that because you comment, commented that you were having suicidal thoughts. But did you yeah. know, because of what happened to Andrew, how to manage that and bring mm-hmm. your team of people in? Absolutely. And, you know, I think I knew that that wasn't the answer because when Andrew died by suicide, it didn't eliminate his pain. It didn't take away his pain. All it did was take his pain and hand it and give it away to all the people he loved the most. So I knew that suicide wasn't the answer. And so whenever I was feeling um, overwhelmed, whenever I was struggling with those thoughts, I would pick up the phone and call one of my best friends and tell them that I was struggling. I would I would tell my therapist in counseling that I was struggling. I had friends that would check in and ask me how I was doing and that were brave enough to say the word suicide. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think the most dangerous thing we can do is keep those thoughts to ourselves. The most dangerous thing we can do is believe that um, we're not capable of of doing that or or that's never going to happen. You know, I think um, suicide has to be brought out of the dark. I think it has to be brought into the light and those thoughts and those feelings have to be brought into the light. And so, um, yeah, don't stay isolated in your pain. I think the greatest gift I gave myself was to not stay isolated in my pain and to share my pain with others. Yeah, and that's that shows strength. And nothing to be ashamed about. And if you're listening and you're having those thoughts, we uh, the Big Silence has the crisis text line, 24-7, free, anonymous, um, be connect- connected with a crisis counselor that can get you help. It's uh, just text HERO, H-E-R-O, to 741741. Um, Kayla, thank you for this conversation. I admire you. And like I said, your strength. Um, are you, how how are the boys doing? They're doing so good. <laughs> they are thriving at the beach. I mean, <laughs> it has been the biggest blessing to live here. Just the culture and to be able to raise kids outside. We're never home. We're just outside all the time. We're at the beach with friends. The beach is our park. You know, the beach is our playground. Where we lived before, we used to run into friends at the park. And it's like, now we run into friends at the beach. And they're super into skateboarding. So it's like, we're either at the beach or we're at the skate park and we're outside and they're having a blast. And you would never know that their dad died four years ago. You just would never know because they're so full of joy and they're so happy. They have so much energy (laughs) and they're so fully alive and fully present the gift of life every single day. And I know that their grief journey is going to be a journey. I know Mm -hmm. I describe their grief as a slow dripping faucet. And so it's like a little bit at a time is going to drip in for them as they understand um, the totality of the loss and the person that they lost and what really happened. And they know he died by suicide. They know what suicide means. And I know it's going to be an ongoing conversation and we have a lot of work to do as they're growing up. But right now, this season is so sweet and so special. My oldest is almost 10. Uh, my middle guy is eight and my youngest is six. And it's just a blast. I'm having so much fun growing up with them. We're growing up together and rebuilding our life together. And it's been such a gift and a joy to be their mom. Yeah. Well, thank you for chatting with us today. I really appreciate it. And your story, the more you talk about it, helps so many and saves so many lives. So thank you. Thanks for having me. It's been such a gift to be here. And thanks for being brave with me in this conversation too. The big silence. The big silence.